had sex with the cleaning woman on your desk? <laughs> Who are you? How did you do that? <laughs> well, sometimes I'd be in the office working late at night, you know, and, uh, <laughs> you know, being the, uh, the horny Jew that I am, uh, you know, occasionally a woman would <laughs> be dusting around. <laughs> we all have thoughts, and fortunately I had an outlet for some of those. My favorite, and I think the quintessential George line response ever in Seinfeld was in the red dot where Mr. Lipman, uh, the head of the publishing company that George is at least temporarily working for, calls him into the office. It's come to my attention that you and the cleaning woman have engaged in sexual intercourse on the desk in your office. Is that correct? And you know, you just go, what is the response going to be to that? And, and Larry wrote the best one, which was this long pause where you, where, where you do see every possible response run through George's head until he finally opts for one. Was that wrong? <laughs> Should I not have done that? I tell you, I gotta plead ignorance on this thing because if anyone had said anything to me at all when I first started here that that sort of thing was frowned upon. <laughs> that is George Costanza. Nothing sums it up better. To have, to be able to see the catalog of outs that run through his head to go, no, nah, that's not gonna work, that's not gonna work. Well, let me just go <laughs> to the bottom line. I didn't know that was wrong. <laughs> that is... That's what the character's all about. In the Red Dot episode, one of the main storylines was Jerry inadvertently causes a friend of Elaine to go off the wagon by slipping him a drink at a party. The final scene of the script had the friend fully off the wagon in a raging alcoholic fury stumbling around <laughs> Elaine's office. And that was the final scene. And I called on Larry and Jerry and I said, well, That wasn't right. That we should we should have him uh, we should have him off 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 of alcohol at the end of the show and and uh, I think I threw something in there but it, it didn't make that much of a difference to me and so for the first and only time in the history of the Seinfeld show they invaded the closing stand-up sequence and cut away from Jerry doing the jokes to show the actors, David Norton, in the crowd and he hoists an obviously non-alcoholic drink to show that somewhere between the final scene and the closing credits, he had recovered his sobriety and was back on the wagon. The first time uh, we heard that he, the name Newman on the show was in the uh, second season where a character in the building called Newman uh, was referred to. I think he called Kramer on the phone and he was going to commit suicide and, and Kramer told him to jump. Boy, I have really had it with Newman. He wakes me up again last night at 3 o'clock in the morning to tell me he's going up onto the roof to kill himself. What would you say? <laughs> I said jump. <laughs> And the following season, we did a show where I guess we needed a, a, a friend for Kramer, somebody in the building, and we'd already heard this name Newman before, so let's see, let's use this guy, let's use the same guy. We've already introduced him. So um, we had a casting session for this character, Newman, and then uh, Wayne Knight came in. And I was excited about that audition because I had, uh, I was a fan of the show, and uh, and thought, well, here's a shot at getting on something that's actually good. And you just, you know it when you see it. it does, you, you know in about five seconds when somebody's right for something, and man, he was, he was just terrific. I thought we thought it might disturb Kramer's mystique if you actually saw any friends of his. We wanted him to be kind of, uh, you know, an, an island unto himself. But uh, obviously, Wayne was such a perfect... Uh, a compadre and, and counterpoint to him. There was no expectation of, uh, of, of Newman being a recurring character. Uh, this was strictly a one-off shot, as far as I knew. Uh, and at the time, the formulation of Newman was, was different than it, uh, than it became. Newman was going to be the, uh, the son of the landlord and the building snitch. You should just eat fruit. You can't eat fruit, it makes me incompetent. <laughs> Gina, over here. Hello, Gina. Hello, Jerry. 
Oh, no, man. That was the purpose that was being served in that first episode, because he had seen Jerry uh, making out with uh, his friend's girlfriend who was in a coma. How's he doing? Well, he looks happy to me. I hope he stays this happy when he wakes up. Why wouldn't he? No reason. I'll have a lot of catching up to do, I guess. I'll bring him up to date. I know that Larry and Jerry appreciate good characters. Heck, they're from New York, and you see the best characters on the street there. Uh, our show was driven by character, and there was no way they were going to let Wayne Knight go. Somewhere in the mix, the son of the landlord kind of dropped out, and uh, Building Snitch just turned into, you know, pure evil uh, over time. I did it right in this bed, Martin, right in front of you. I want my vacuum cleaner. <laughs> People ask all the time, why did Jerry not like Newman? Newman was in, in, it was an instinctive dislike of the, of the character. Frankly, he was the only one who expressed it. Nobody really liked Newman. He was the first person on the show, my own show, who was coming on to sabotage me in some way. And so why would I not hate him forever for that? Newman's first uh, appearance, which was actually in The Revenge, uh, was he was off camera threatening suicide and uh when it first aired the voice of newman was larry david oh, Kramer! <gasps> that's newman <laughs> i'm on the road once i got the part larry being a stickler for detail said that when we go to syndication i'm going to have you record this so that it'll be alpha omega you and that there will never be a time that you weren't newman and um I, you know i was very glad uh, to do that uh, for scale. Anyway, uh... <laughs> Kramer! <gasps> That's Newman! I'm on the roof! In the Subway episode, I was very much interested in could you, could you tell a story that totally took place on the subway. It seemed like an urban New York kind of a story. Could, was there an audacious way of sort of tackling that problem? It was actually a hard week for us because we really, the four of us, didn't see each other. We had nothing to do with it. We had one scene in the beginning and one scene at the end. My storyline was to be, I was going to a lesbian wedding, which is, uh, which was really risque then. Imagine what it is today with all this controversy. It's a, a lesbian wedding. <laughs> Uh-huh, yep, yep, I'm the, um, <laughs> the best man. My first and foremost memory of doing that was that I was um, newly pregnant and sick as a dog. And I was fighting nausea the entire episode, so any disgruntlement you saw on the subway was purely uh, a hormonal-induced nausea. The subway episode was interesting. We had to get a subway. And we didn't want to build one. It would be quite expensive. But Warner Brothers had one from some movie they had done, and we rented that. But it was really a bummer to get here. It was in lots of pieces. It had to be put on a platform. It had to be rigged to rock. We put it up on springs and put some two-by-fours under it, and the grip stand there and shake it up and down. And then all of the actors and extras on the subway were choreographed to move backwards or forwards when the subway started or stopped. To make it look like several cars, we kept on redressing it, shooting separate little sections of it. It's amazing a little space could look so large. And you'll notice in most of the shows that a lot of it is done in close-up, two shots, three shots, so you can get away with a lot. It's just that one second or two seconds that you ever see a master or, or a wide shot that sells the whole idea of where you are, of course. Well, after the subway show, when it was sent back to Warner Brothers, the driver went under a low underpass and destroyed the set. <laughs> so CBS had to pay to rebuild that set. So I designed and we built a new New York subway car. But this time, I designed it and built it on trailer beds. So all you had to do was roll it in on stage, put it together, plug it in, and you were ready to shoot. The lighting was built in, the pneumatic doors, everything was built in, it was a unit. And it worked great, it's still in use today. Features have used it, everybody uses that subway car.
Pez Dispenser was a fun episode for me. George was dating a concert pianist, and there was a recital that everybody goes to. I was the pianist. There was a point at which Jerry was fooling around with his Pez Dispenser and made Elaine laugh, which made the pianist make a mistake. And I made a little mistake. Larry said, more, bigger, bigger mistake, I'm bigger mistake, bigger, bigger. Uh, in post, when I, I did it again, I was fooling her. Uh, finally, I said, okay, I'll, I'll go all the way, and I'm playing, and came time for the mistake, I just took my elbow and went on the keys, and I could see through the glass, Larry going. <laughs> <laughs> after that show aired, Pez was, I mean, I wish I had taken stock, Pez was back on top. And they actually had sent us, you know, Pez dispensers with, with Jerry's head on it, and I think maybe mine or, or Michael's. I mean, you know, it, <laughs> we took a relatively dead obscure product. And, and that was very notable because that, I think that may have been the first time where you really saw, you know, something that we were just goofing around with on the show suddenly have a rebound in, in the world that was huge, huge. And I, I was very taken by that, that suddenly, you know, everyone was walking around with Pez dispensers again. We did a show, How to Get Rid of a Guy. That was in the first season, right? who's your friend, how do you break up with a guy, but this show was, how do you make a new friend with a guy who you've just met, who you kind of want to be friends with, it's a little awkward, do you call him up, I mean, how does, how does that work? And I, I thought that was a really uh, funny idea, and, and, um, and so that was one of the stories, and okay, so who is this guy? Yeah, at that point, I had, I had met quite a few celebrities, and I, you know, there's nothing, uh, that you, you kind of, after a while, you, you, you're not that excited uh, to meet them because you realize they're just people, most of them. And, uh, but sports stars, uh, and certainly the Mets were my favorite team, and Keith Hernandez was my favorite player. And I remember the morning that he was going to be on the show, standing in my closet, looking at my shirts, going, what should I wear? I'm going to meet Keith Hernandez, what should I wear? And I actually even remember feeling sweaty as I was driving to work that I was going to meet Keith Hernandez and uh, how exciting this was going to be. And it was very interesting because of, of all the principal actors, Jerry didn't was like speechless around me for, for three to three, two to three days. And it was exciting and he was great fun and we became friends after that. Excuse me, I don't want to disturb you. I'm Keith Hernandez and I just want to tell you what a big fan I am. I love your comedy. <laughs> Really? Oh, yeah. I've always wanted to do what you do. Do what I do? You're one of my favorite ball players of all time. <laughs> Mine, too. <laughs> the uh, boyfriend, uh, new friend episode was, was an hour. There was just uh, too much material. And sometimes you're in that sort of netherworld where you have not enough for one show and, and uh, not enough for an hour and too much for a half hour. So you have to decide which way you want to go. And in that one, um, we decided to, we had to find uh, another story and, uh, and bring it to an hour. Then I guess the scenes that were added to make it an hour show to use on sweeps was the uh, development of Elaine and I going out and I'm smoking and she blew me off. I was aware of who he was and the lure and the hugeness of what a fabulous baseball player was, not to mention the fact that I'm surrounded by these boys on the set and my husband at home, they're all flipping out that it's Keith Hernandez. And uh, so I, I was aware of sort of what a, a god he was at that time. Elaine, hmm. you don't know the first thing about first base. Oh, well, I know something about getting to first base. <laughs> and I know you'll never be there. The way I figure it, I've already been there. <laughs> and I plan on rounding second tonight at around 11 o'clock. Uh, uh, well, uh, I'd watch the third base coach if I were you, because I don't think he's waving you in. 
such fun to play that with him. Such fun. Loved it. I think the guys on the set were more in love with Keith than, than I was. They're all sitting there like this. They just love that guy. That episode uh, was interesting because it uh, in, included a parody of the Oliver Stone JFK picture. I guess because JFK the movie had been out at the time and uh, Tom Leopold was actually a, um, he was a real assassination buff. So I don't know, so somehow all that coalesced. Our day was ruined. <laughs> There was a lot of people, you know, they're waiting by the player's parking lot. Now, we're coming down the ramp. Newman was in front of me. Hernandez was coming toward us. As he passes us, Newman turns and says, Nice game, pretty boy. <laughs> Hernandez continued past us up the ramp. Then, a second later, something happened that changed us in a very deep and profound way from that day forward. What was it? He spit on us. <laughs> and I screamed out, I'm it! Then I turned and the spit ricocheted off him and it hit me. Wow. Tom Leopold, who had written uh, The Suicide previously, was a, an assassination buff. And when he went to see JFK, he noticed that I was in the movie and I was playing a character named Numa. Um, and so the serendipity aspect of that, you know, added to uh, the mix, and I came back as Newman, uh, doing the same reenactment that I had done in uh, in JFK. Kramer, if you'll indulge me, according to your story, Hernandez passes you and starts walking up the ramp. Mm -hmm. Then you say you were struck on the right temple. The spit then proceeds to ricochet off the temple, striking Newman between the third and the fourth rib. The spit then came off the rib, made a right turn, hitting Newman in the right wrist, causing him to drop his baseball cap. The spit then splashed off the wrist, pauses in midair, mind you, makes a left turn, and lands on Newman's left thigh. That is one magic loogie. I do remember doing that scene uh, being one of the most exciting experiences of the series for me because it was a long, complicated speech and uh, I was concerned about getting through it and it working and I remember um, doing it and I think it's the first take that's in the episode uh, because it just flew and I remember walking out back into the hallway there and just being extremely excited that that's, that speech had gone so well and, th and then everybody got it you know because it was a bit of a risk to uh, parody something like that and have people understand it. The audience howled to such an extent that the laughs actually had to be shortened in editing but as I heard this it occurred to me that if a comedy show is able to wring comedy out of what is clearly a, a national tragedy, that this show had risen to another level. In preparing the scenes for the JFK sequence, we watched the film and staged it in a way in a time frame that matched what Mr. Stone had done. When I saw the script on about and who the second spitter was going to be, and they originally wanted to use Daryl Strawberry, but Daryl had some series of bad publicity. I said, "You sure you want to have Daryl do this?" And you know, Daryl's a good friend. And I said, "This is—I don't think it's the right time for Daryl to be someone spitting on fans." Keith Hernandez called Roger McDowell, who was with the Dodgers at that point, to come do this part in the film where he spits on our hero Kramer, in order to make it look like the exit at at the stadium, uh, we built a wire fence and, and put some shrubs in. To get the reality of the scratchy, grainy footage, I, we, we made a positive print from the film and then spooled it out on the ground in the, in the lab. And I literally dragged it up and down the hallway to get dirt on it and stamping on it and whipping it around and playing catch with it and cleaned it off and sent it back through the transfer. And then we overexposed it, added a lot of chroma and worked out beautifully. The moment. <laughs> 
that everybody talks about in my storyline of that show is, is when I come flying out of the bathroom because Kramer's messing up my thing with the, the latex salesman. And my pants were around my knees, and it was a huge laugh, a huge audience laugh. How did you know who they wanted? And then Jerry, he came back in the door, saw my, my you know, underweared ass lying there in front of him, and ad-libbed. And you want to be my latex salesman. Well, the place, the studio came apart at the seams. And yeah, I mean, I, I got a great laugh out of it, but the capper was unbelievable. And he just, you know, <laughs> he just threw it in. I'm sorry, I can't do this. What? I can't do it, I can't. It's, it's, it's too soon, I don't know you. I, I can't help you move, I'm sorry, I can't, I just can't. <laughs> As the years have gone by now, it's the generation that didn't see me play. They don't relate to me as Keith Hernandez, baseball player. You know, they relate to me as Keith Hernandez in a Seinfeld show. And I have kids come up to me this day. They're now, what, it's been well over 10 years now. So they're, some of them are in their 20s. And they'll come behind me and go, well, I, I'm not going to help you move. Or what was it like kissing Elaine? Which I always say was awful. Eight, ta eight takes, brutal. That was the hardest part, but <laughs> anyway, uh, it kind of, uh, a younger generation knows who I am because of that show, absolutely.